All right, so this session is on exploiting virtual economies. Uh, specifically, I guess this will be a case study on Guild Wars 2. Um, typically, I go online as Manfred, and I'm into reverse engineering weird stuff, proprietary protocols, obfuscated code, digital assets, blockchain -y things, which is a big topic these days, and virtual economies. Um, when exploiting virtual economies or any systems, uh, typically you have to do a lot of reverse engineering uh, and typically high value um, systems are obfuscated, they use proprietary protocols. So you really have to like spend a lot of time digging into things to figure out how they work in order to break them. Um, so I've been involved in virtual economies and exploiting them for over 20 years. Uh, some of the bigger names are like World of Warcraft, Rift Online, Lord of the Rings Online, uh, Elder Scrolls Online, uh, and a bunch of others. Uh, I think the total is close to 30. Uh, but before we talk about exploiting virtual economies or the motivations to exploit a virtual economy, um, I mean, there's two or three major motivations to exploit a virtual economy. One is for profit, and two, uh, like the stereotype says, or it's cliche, is for the laws. It's uh, clowning on other people, trolling, and things like that. But if you want to exploit a virtual economy for profit, you have, well, let's go over some terms first. Um, RMT is real money transfer. Uh, typically online games like World of Warcraft, they don't allow you to like go into the game, earn a bunch of gold and then sell it on eBay, for example. Um, so if you get caught in a game selling stuff outside of their closed wall garden ecosystem, they'll close your account down. Um, some sites where you can like sell virtual currencies, like let's say you log into World of Warcraft and get a bunch of gold and you want to sell it, you can either list it on player auctions, which is an eBay-like platform where you connect sellers directly to buyers, or you sell it to a wholesaler. For example, uh, the screenshot over here is egpal.com, where you can go in and buy a bunch of gold or assets or in-game items on a number of games. And the typical workflow when exploiting a virtual economy is you gather, well, you create an account, you go into the game, you find an exploit or you play legit, you gather a bunch of gold or items, and then you sell it to players or wholesale to resellers. So the exploit lifecycle. Um, step one is find the target game, or uh, I'm gonna use the term game in a virtual co economy synonymously because they are pretty much the same. A game is a walled garden virtual economy where it's like the economy exists within the game because there's typically no on ramps and off ramps into a game. So you find a virtual economy, you find the, you reverse engineer it, see how it works, find an exploit to use that exploit to stockpile a bunch of golden items or a bunch of uh, gold is similar to virtual currency. You, you get a bunch of items or virtual currencies or in blockchain speak, you get a bunch of NFTs and vir virtual currencies. And then you sell this wholesale to a supplier. That's easy, usually the easiest route because you don't want to uh, burden yourself with like connecting to a bunch of buyers because then you have to go one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, arrange the sales and everything. It's easier to just offload it to a supplier where they take care of the retail side of things. And then you complete this cycle until the exploit is fixed. And then you either find a new exploit or you move on to a, a different game or a virtual economy. So like I said, uh, Guild Wars 2, it's a World of Warcraft type clone. Uh, it has player to player trading. That is, you can log into the game with two characters and you, then you can like trade amongst each other. Like if you kill something and then you get a cool weapon or a sword or something that, that something like drops an item, you can like open the trade window with your friend in game and like give them that item. Um, so it has player to player trading and it's very popular. And it also has a very large feature set. Uh, it has crafting, like you can create new things out of primitive materials, like you can combine a rock and a stick to create this rock axe or whatever. Um, it has guild banks, so it can collaborate with a bunch of players to create a guild and then you can like share banking uh, features with that guild. It also has personal banks and has auction houses and vendors and a bunch of other features. Uh, and what that means is we have a larger tax surface in a popular game, which means it's a good exploit target. Uh, so phase one, exploit discovery. Uh, in this case, we're gonna be looking at the auction house. 
So this is a typical screen when interacting with the auction house inside of the game. Uh, here you see a bunch of items listed and their prices. And these small numbers in here represent how many of those items are available. So for example, we'll look at a specific item and we can see, so, so multiple things going on here. Um, up here, you can buy an arbitrary number of items up to the amount that's available for sale. So let's say if I wanted to buy three of these things, um, you can see that at this price tier, there's only two available. So if you try to buy three, it'll buy two at this price point and one at this price point. And that's a GUI um, feature to make things easier. Because if you want to buy three of them, you don't want to buy two and then have to go back out and come back in and buy another one. It'll, the game lets you buy as many as you want and it'll kind of figure out, uh, it'll tally up and buy whatever's available at whatever prices. Um, again, so if we buy one, it'll just take one out of this price tier. If we buy three, it'll take two out of this price tier, and then it'll buy one out of the next price tier. Uh, so to buy three, you buy two at one gold, 75 silver, 27 copper. And then you buy one at one gold, 75 silver, and 28 copper. And the total price is five gold, 25 silver, and 82 copper. So this is an interesting feature because how does the game do this? How does the protocol work? Um, we, we just play the what if game. Uh, first, we figure out how it works. And this, uh, this is how it works. When you buy items that span across multiple price tiers, you basically send two um, requests. You say, hey, give me two at this price point. And then you say, hey, give me one at this price point. And this number here, the 45977, is basically the item type specifying that item. So you're telling the game, hey, give me this item, give me two from this price bucket or price tier, and then give me one from this price tier. So you're buying three items in one transaction from two different price tiers. And this is interesting because um, we start playing the what if game. You're like, what if I fudge the prices around? What if I fudge the quantities around? Will the game behave uh, as intended? Or the root of all exploits is finding functionality that the developer didn't intend. So to cut to the chase, the too long didn't read version of it is, is on the left here, we see a legit buy packet where we're buying one from this price tier and two from the other price tier. So you're buying three items legit. You spend five gold, 25 silver, and 82 copper. On the right, is our exploit. We buy two at that price tier. And then we say, hey, give me another one for a single copper or a single unit of that virtual currency. And surprisingly enough, the server accepts this. Um, so you get three items and you spend three gold, 50 silver, and 54 copper. Um, you got yourself a pretty huge discount. You basically bought two things for the legit price and you bought one thing for a price that you specify yourself. And the best Part about this is the seller gets the full five gold, 25 silver, 82 copper. So you have currency inflation going on here. And it gets even better because the buyer and the seller can be the same account. Um, so what does that mean? For example, let's say you have an account, you go into the game and you list 10 items for sale for a thousand gold per item. So, so your potential earnings are 10,000 gold. And then if you run the exploit or you um, exploit the functionality in the system, you buy a single item for the legitimate price of a thousand gold. And then you can buy the other nine items for a single copper. Uh, if you combine it all in the same request, the server will be like, yeah, this is cool. Um, you will get all 10 items. You will spend 1000 gold and one copper. The seller, which is also your account, will get um, 9,000 gold because you spent 10,000 and it took away the fee of 1,000 for the legitimate purchase. So for each exploit cycle, you get 9,000 gold. And this takes seconds to do. So you could uh, create an infinite amount of currency essentially over a short period of time. 
Okay, so we examine the auction house, how it works. We see that we can create a lot of money per exploit cycle. Uh, what do we do with that now? Um, so the second phase uh, is to stockpile um, items in gold uh, and sell them. So Guild Wars 2 again, um, it has supply and demand. There's a lot of players that like to play Guild Wars 2 and we know these players like stuff. Uh, there's two ways that these players could get stuff. Uh, option one, they could farm or grind for it like by playing the game legitimately. Or two, they could buy it from other players uh, via sites like EGPAL or player auctions. And here we have an example of uh, uh, an item in the game. It's, called, it's a sword called Eternity. And it has a sell price for about 4,000 gold. Uh, and this is again on the auction house. So we have market forces in play and this, this price will fluctuate. So one gold, if you were to buy it uh, outside of the game using RMT, uh, goes for about a nickel. And so if the eternity is around 4,000 gold, it's worth about 161 US dollars for this one item. And this is the market graph for this item. And you can see it trades like any other item. There's price fluctuations, fluctuations in the volume and, and things like that. But this item has pretty good volume demonstrating that, you know, uh, the supply and demand in the economy is really well inside of Guild Wars 2. So uh, how do we turn this into cash? So we want to stockpile lots of accounts with lots of gold and sell them to wholesalers like EGPAL. Um, but there's a problem. Um, Guild Wars 2 has account restrictions to combat real money transfers. Um, you know, they're kind of hip to the game that people are playing this game to earn money and they want to stop this for whatever reason. Um, so they put in restrictions, one of them being that new accounts, like if you create a Guild Wars 2 account today, you cannot transfer large amounts of gold to other players inside that game from your account for 30 days. There's like this 30 day cool off or warm up period. So, all right, that's easy. We'll get around it by creating lots of accounts per day or create a bunch of accounts and then we'll use them in a month when that restriction is no longer applicable. So our first attempt, we create 10 accounts per day for 30 days, and that'll give us a one month supply uh, in 30 days. Uh, so our cost is 300 accounts times $30 per CD key, uh, which is about $9,000. And the plan is to stock one account with about 40 to 50,000 40 to 50,000 end game gold, which is about $1,500 worth of stock. So our total potential revenue is 300 accounts times $1,500, which is about half a million dollars, minus you know, uh, your cost of $9,000 for the account CD keys. So that's pretty good. Uh, what was that, like 90, 95% profit ratio? So uh, we did this, we stocked a bunch of accounts, we created a bunch of accounts, and our first attempts resulted in failure. We sold for a total number of three days. Our total revenue was pretty low. Uh, which was about 3K. Our net loss was about $6,000 because we spent 9,000 on accounts. We earned 3,000 and the net loss ended up being uh, $6,000. So what went wrong? Um, we used about 30 accounts and somehow the Guild Wars two people were able to figure out and associate our 270 other accounts. And they banned all 300 accounts in one fell swoop at the click of a button basically. Uh, so we kind of dug into this, and this is an interesting long side story that I won't bother you guys with because it gets kind of detailed. But the gist of it is, is that typically um, game files, like when you install a game, the game files will be identical between installs. Like if I install a game and you install a game, and if you hash every single file in, within that game, they'll be identical. But the Guild Wars 2 team did something sneaky. Um, the game uses an unusually large file to store its texture, sound, and mesh models. Um, they packed everything into a single file, which is 48 gigabytes. And what they did was they implanted a 128-bit value, uh, a 16-byte value in there that's unique for each install. So they were fring fingerprinting um, all the installs. And this fingerprint was transmitted to the game server by the game client when you log in. 
So they were, they were able to associate a game install instance with any accounts that use that game install. And the reason they did that is because typically um, these virtual economies are exploited in countries like China. Um, and sometimes the connection to US based game servers is pretty slow. So typically if you're in another country uh, with a slow internet connection, typically you'll download the game once and share it via a USB drive with all your friends or any other computers you're um, going to be uh, participating in the virtual economy with. Um, so that way they were able to track and associate farming operations via a copied game install. And if one account was uh, you know, violating the terms of service of that game, um, they would ban all associated accounts that were associated with that install. So it was, it was a very effective way of uh, terminating players' accounts that were participating in their economy against their terms of service. Um, so digging down a little bit, um, when you log into the game, you send an authentication packet. It has your computer username, your computer name, and the 16-byte value, which uniquely identifies your install. So we figured out how they did this. We were able to modify this workflow and basically modify the client that when you log into the game, even if you're using the same install between two different machines, we just modified the packet on the fly to give it a new random ID. So that way you had a ratio of one to one to unique IDs to um, game account. So basically when we created accounts, each account looked like it came from a brand new install. So on our second attempt, using this knowledge, we modified the game client to basically say, hey, I'm logging in and it's a brand new install. So there is no association between all this crazy stuff and all these installs for the Guild Wars 2 people could figure out, hey, this account was acting malicious, ban any other account that was using this game install. So we are able to bypass all of that. So again, we did the exact same workflow, but using a modified client, uh, we created 300 more accounts. We stocked each, uh, we stocked 10 per day with about $1,500 worth of uh, gold on each account. And after 30 days, we went to the market again. And the results were that it was successful. Uh, the exploit lasted from 2012 to 2014. Uh, but still, the Guild Wars 2 team used uh, other metrics to um, discover accounts. For example, they'd see that a character on a game account was uh, participating in excessive transactions that were abnormal from the normal player base. Uh, they, they, they had many tricks up their sleeve to make our lives a little bit more difficult. And the bans were very disruptive because once you establish a supply chain with our resellers, if you get banned, that supply chain shrinks, um, the customer base shrinks. And then once you um, get things going again, you got to spin up that flywheel, the supply chains fill, fill back out again uh, and things get going. So a ban was disruptive. It cost us about you know two to three weeks worth of revenue at a time. Uh, so the total revenue for, for Guild Wars 2 is, is redacted. Um, we spent a lot of time playing cat and mouse with the Guild Wars 2 developers. Um, like I said, one trick they did was to implant a fingerprint inside of the game install. They did many other things. Um, but the, the gist of it was that the cool thing in participating in virtual economies and exploring them is you know, being able to do research, write fun code, and fill the unmet demand from players that just wanted to have fun and play the game without grinding. And that's that's the key is um, shadow economies exist because game developers um, squash the free market. Uh, and anytime you squash a free market, a black market emerges. So these virtual economies, especially in online games where um, the free markets are very restricted, you have all these black markets popping up or shadow economies that you know um, there's a lot of opportunities in. And that's all I have. Great, thank you very much, Manfred. Um, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, yep. I think 
don't know if we have any more questions. Um, I mean, just a little question for you. Like, how do you feel like blockchain fits in to this whole uh, new virtual economy and, and protecting against exploitation from your experience? Yeah, so, so that's a great question because, um, you know, NFTs are like all the hype right now. Um, and NFT-like things in the digital world kind of existed um, since, you know, the mid to late 90s. Like, for example, um, in late 1990, I basically sold what, what was essentially an NFT. It was, uh, it was inside of a game called Ultima Online. And the game, you log into the game, and it's a 2D map. And the, the resources were scarce in that. Like, there was land where you could place houses on. But there was only so much land. So you, if you place a house on a piece of land, there is less land for everybody else to use. So it was a scarce resource, and you had all these supply and demand curves, and you basically had what was a real estate bubble in this game. So I placed the castle down on some land that was a scarce resource. The castle was also worth a lot of money inside the game, and I put it up on eBay, and it sold for three thousand dollars. You know, that was like my first uh, virtual sale, and. In a lot of the ways, it mirrors like what's going on right now. But where blockchain comes in is, you know, uh, the only way you can interact with an account is if you're a holder of that private key. So um, a lot of the focus is to make the blockchain engine itself as secure as possible. And then that pushes out the envelope of security and threats to the users. You know, how do you protect your private key? And then you have to... Um, combat all these emerging threats that are targeting people's password managers, the way they're storing keys. People are using paper wallets. Uh, they're using them offline. And in a lot of cases, you see that people are using open source paper wallets and they're thinking, hey, this is an open source project. It's got to be legit because other people are looking at it. Well, but they don't look at it. So if everybody else thinks the same thing, then nobody's looking at the source code. And there's been at least two cases I'm aware of where like a paper wallet was compromised where the random seed generation was done in a deterministic way. So even if you're running this thing offline, you're generating random keys that are producing values that the attacker knows about. Um, so uh, as a whole, I think the blockchain thing is helping, uh, you know, protect assets in terms of integrity. Uh, and I do believe games in the future will go and put their assets uh, on blockchains. Well, and also to just, you know, I mean, you said that games are putting an incredible amount of effort to try to stop people from being able to sell these items outside, right? But I yep. mean, in a way that's kind of going against the grain, kind of like, you know, back in the iPhone hacking days, you know, where Apple is just trying to take everything and force people, you know, off of Cydia and stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of going against the grain. Do you think that this may change the landscape of games and how people see games where, you know, it becomes a common given to be yeah. selling in-game items and allowing them to have on and off ramps in a secure fashion without having, you know, all these other issues. I'm sure lots of things happen between buyer and seller without escrow and like scam yep. and since it's unregulated it's just like kind of dangerous and maybe that's one reason they've stopped or trying to do that yeah absolutely uh i think there's going to be a game that's going to showcase how you can merge the world of online gaming and blockchains and nfts to give players the ability to have player verifiable assets like true ownership and they're going to open up these off ramps and on ramps to allow trading inside of these games and outside markets and I think there's going to be a game that's going to come out within the next five years that's going to hit it big. And it's going to be the new example and there's going to be a paradigm shift. And games typically don't want to take on risk. Like they won't want to take on a new monetization model. So they'll see somebody else, you know, lead the way, spearhead the way. They'll see them succeed wildly and the entire market's going to shift. Like all games will come out using blockchain technologies and open markets. Because uh, essentially when you have an open market, you have players that are basically uh, as part of your design team because players know best what other players want, not the game developers, not like a dozen game developers going through this top-down model. It's the players creating you know, a vibrant economy with player-to-player -player commerce. And I think that's going to happen really soon. Awesome, man. Um, right. Do you have any closing comments? Or are you, you ready to go? You good? Oh, just rock on. I'm awesome. excited for the virtual economy of tomorrow and yeah. the way things are going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations right. on uh, yep. yeah, you can get in there. Yep. Thanks you for take having care, me. Man. See you. Yep.